The year is 1550. The crown prince of the Tungu Empire, a man named Bayanog, is hunting down a rebellious governor named Smim Hatwa in the south of the empire. The clever pretender king has managed to evade the military mastermind that is Bayanog for three whole months. On April 30th of 1550, Taban Shwedi, the current emperor of Tungu, was assassinated on his 34th birthday. By all means, the crown should have effortlessly passed to Bayanog, the best friend and closest advisor to Taban Shwedi. Instead, there was only chaos, as every single province in the recently created Tungu Empire chose to rebel against their new emperor. Bayanog was now alone in the jungle, chasing a ghost, with only 2,000 loyal soldiers at his command. His situation was beyond bleak, but the man known to history as the conqueror of the Ten Directions would reclaim his kingdom and form the largest empire ever seen in the history of Southeast Asia. Bayanog was born on January 16th of 1516. He was the eldest son of a man named Sui and a woman named Shin, and at birth his parents named him Yatut. There is not much concrete evidence of his ancestry, with different accounts saying his family came from the peasant class, while others say that he was from a noble family and a descendant of the kings of the Pagan Empire. Either way, his ancestry does not matter. What does matter is who he shared his mother's breast with. Three months after his own birth, Taban Shwedi would be born. Bayanog's mother, Shin, would become the wet nurse to the future king of Tungu. The two boys grew up together in the Tungu royal palace and naturally became best friends who shared a brotherly connection. Bayanog would have a total of three full-blooded siblings, his sister Dama Dewi, who was the oldest, and two younger brothers named Minyi Sithu and Thado Damayaza. Bayanog also had two younger half-brothers, slash cousins, as his father married two sisters, their names being Minkong and Thado Minsaw. Taban Shwedi also had one younger sister named Thakin Giyu. All eight of these children would grow up together and become lifelong friends. When Taban Shwedi was only 15, his elderly father, King Niao, would die, leaving an adolescent as the new king of Tungu. One of Taban Shwedi's first actions was to marry Dama Dewi, the sister of Bayanog. Shortly after this, Bayanog was appointed to an advisory role. From here, the teenage king plotted on conquest, first targeting the kingdom of Hantawadi in the south. In 1532, Bayanog was appointed as a general, conducting annual raids into Hantawadi over the course of the next six years, and beginning to show his skill on the fields of battle. In 1534, his close friendship with his king would come under threat, along with his life. Bayanog was caught in 4K banging Thakin Giyu, Taban Shwedi's sister. I mean, to be fair, Taban Shwedi was also laying pipe on Bayanog's sister. This, however, was an act of treason, and in most cases, its punishment was execution. Taban Shwedi could not bear to see his best friend dead on his own orders. Instead of punishing Bayanog, Taban Shwedi rewarded him. Bayanog was forced into a marriage with Princess Thakin Giyu. Then he was given the princely title of Kwayatin Narada, replacing his birth name of Yatut. Now the childhood best friends had become double brother-in-laws. With that settled, they could resume their war on Hantawadi. In 1538, the Tungu had weakened their foe enough to take their capital of Pegu. The king of Hantawadi, Takayutbi, began a retreat to the safety of his ally, Prome. Takayutbi led a small part of the army by boat, whilst the bulk of his force, numbering some 16,000, began a march over land. Taban Shwedi ordered for Bayanog to cut off this army before it could reach Prome. Leading only 4,000 men, Bayanog was outmanned and outgunned. Still, he obliterated his foe, which allowed Tungu to conquer the majority of Hanthawadi. After winning this battle against all odds, Taban Shwedi rewarded his brother-in-law yet again, giving him his trademark title of Bayanog, which translates to King's Older Brother. This title meant that Bayanog would inherit the Tungu Empire in the event that Taban Shwedi dies before him. Shortly after this, 
Bayanog also became the chief administrator of Tabanshwedi, handling most of the day-to-day -day affairs of the kingdom. From 1538 to 1549, Tabanshwedi, Bayanog, and his brothers went on a mostly successful conquering spree across Southeast Asia, only facing the setback of two stalemates from Thailand and Arakan. However, these stalemates sat heavy on the shoulders of Tabanshwedi. The king began to drink heavily, handing over all responsibility of the empire to Bayanog, while Tabanshwedi proceeded to party and hunt. In 1550, a rebellion in Hantawadi, led by a pretender king named Smimhatwa, broke out. Bayanog, along with his two full brothers and half-brother, Minyisithu, Thadodamiyaza, and Thado Minsa, mobilized 2,000 of their best men to kill this traitor. All the while, Tabanshwedi continued in his debauchery, until the fateful day of his 34th birthday came. After celebrations, Tabanshwedi fell into a deep and inebriated sleep. The governor of Sitang province, named Smim Sahut, ordered his men to kill the king. Tabanshwedi was then decapitated in his sleep, and Smim Sahut declared himself as king, along with four other men. That leaves us back where we had begun in 1550. Bayanag was alone in the jungle with 2,000 loyal men, while the empire he had helped build and was supposed to inherit rejected his rule and revolted in every corner. He was, in every sense of the term, a king without a kingdom. Bayanog had to act quick to reclaim his rightful throne. He immediately ends his three-month chase of Smim Hatwa and begins his reunification campaign by marching on the heart and namesake of the empire, the province of Tungu. There was only one problem with this plan. Tungu's new king was Bayanog's half-brother, Minkong. Bayanog was also faced with the challenge of marching to Tungu through miles of rebellious lands including the old capital of Pegu, which had fallen into the hands of Tabanshwedi's assassin. When Smim Sahut saw Bayanog's small retinue approaching, he gathered his own army and prepared to face him in open battle. Bayanog ordered his men to not even look at the opposing force marching in their direction. When Smim Sahut figured out that Pegu was not the goal of Bayanog, he thought it better not to engage the experienced commander. Bayanog and his 2,000 men harmlessly marched past Pegu, continuing their path onto Tungu province. Bayanog marched until reaching only a few miles outside of Tungu city. When the citizens heard of the return of the king's older brother, many people from all backgrounds raced to join his force. Among them being Bayanog's wife, his daughter, and his eldest son, an heir apparent of the fractured empire, Prince Nanda. By August of 1550, his ranks had been bolstered to number nearly 10,000 men and 200 warboats, much better than the 2,000 he had started with. On September 2nd, he mobilized his new army and besieged his younger brother in the city of Tonggu. Minkong managed to hold out against his four brothers for four months before he surrendered. Finally, in January of 1551, Bayanog had reclaimed the city that he had grown up in. As for his rebellious brother, Bayanog chose to forgive him, reuniting the five siblings under a common cause. After capturing the city, Bayanog formally coronated himself as king. However, the work to reunify the Tungu Empire was nowhere near complete. The five brothers planned for their next target, choosing nearby Prome, under the rule of Tabanshwedi's father-in-law, Thado Damayaza. This choice came from a place of geography, controlling Prome meant that Bayanog could take central command of the two rivers that ran through Burma, the Sitang and the mighty Irrawaddy. After three months of consolidating his rule around Tonggu and accepting the surrender of much of the northern section of the empire, who had stayed neutral in the civil war, Bayanog mustered an army to besiege Prome for the fourth time in his life. The siege began in March, but the city managed to hold out as it always had. The pretender king inside, was a much more challenging opponent than Bayanog's disloyal brother. Thado Damayaza was an experienced general in his 50s, who was made famous in challenging the king of Thailand to an elephant duel. The Thai king ran while his wife blocked the pursuing Thado Damayaza. He then cut down the queen in his place. Bayanog withdrew and regrouped his force, besieging Prome 
for the fifth and final time. The siege was off to a bad start. The walls held firm and the garrison stubborn. They needed a miracle to reclaim the city, and a miracle they got. Ming Kong, the once traitorous brother of Bainog, mounted his war elephant and started to charge. Disregarding his own safety, he rammed the gate with his elephant at full speed. The gate collapsed, and the Tungu warriors charged in just behind him. The city was captured, and Thado Damayaza attempted to flee, but was caught along the way. Ming Kong had just proven that he would be nothing but loyal to Bayanog from this point onward. Bayanog was now left with a hard decision. He had spent many of his early and adult years around Thado Damayaza, who had been nothing but good to him up until this point. He viewed the man as something of an uncle figure. Where Bayanog forgave and pardoned his brother, the same treatment was not extended to Thado Damayaza. He executed the man. Bayanog immediately regretted this decision and carried this on his shoulders for the rest of his life. He then appointed his brother, whose name was also Thado Damayaza, as Viceroy of Prom. After the conquest of Prom, Bayanog quickly turned his army to reconquer Pagan, one of the most important centers of Burmese culture. The city was ruled by a man named Sakate, who had taken advantage of the power vacuum left by the late Tabanshwedi. He commanded very little power outside of the city itself, and was far less of a challenge as Pagan fell in just a week to Bayanog. The northern borders of Tabanshwedi's empire had been restored, but Bayanog continued marching north towards the city of Ava and into the heart of the Shan Confederacy. He nearly reached the city before hearing the news. Smim Hatwa, the man who Bayanog was initially chasing when Tabanshwedi was assassinated, began a march on Tongu. By this point, Smim Hatwa had consolidated his rule over much of Hantawadi. In August of 1550, he defeated and killed the assassin of Tabanshwedi, Smim Sahut, subsequently conquering the capital city of Pegu. Bayanog returned in haste to defend Tongu. Smim Hatwa withdrew to Pegu once hearing of the emperor's return. Bayanog gave chase and reached the walls of Pegu by March 12th of 1552. Smim Hatwa, no longer running from Bayanog, exited the walls of his city atop a war elephant. Gesturing towards Bayanog, he challenged him to single combat. Bayanog accepted and confidently rode upon his own elephant to finally meet Smim Hatwa face to face. The duel was brief. Bayanog, an expert warrior, managed to scare Smim Hatwa so much that he fled the scene. Pegu was taken, and the capital was finally in the hands of Bayanog. Smim Hatwa, in a common sight, was on the run. He abandoned his wife and his army. The fleeing king managed to evade capture for an entire year before the Tungu captured and executed the pretender. With that, Bayanog reclaimed Hanthawadi and fully restored the empire of Tabanshwedi to its former glory. Keep in mind that he did this in only two short years, where it had initially taken 13. After this, he named his brother, Minyi Sithu, as the governor of Martaban province. With his empire restored, Bayanog can now refocus his attention north, towards the Shan states. In the summer of 1553, he sent an army led by his 15-year-old son, Prince Nanda, perhaps as an attempt to test his military merit. The Shan, however, were prepared to meet the prince, gathering a force sizable enough for Nanda to call off the invasion before it had even begun. This would be the first of many military setbacks in the life of Nanda. Whilst his son was on campaign, Bayanog was on his own campaign of sorts, beginning a building project of a new royal palace in the capital city of Pegu. By January of 1554, it was completed, and in front of this elaborate palace, Bayanog formally crowned himself as the Tungu Emperor. With his position of King of Tungu now thrown to the side, he named his once traitorous brother, Minkong, as the Viceroy of Tungu Province, showing that the trust between the two siblings was now without a doubt. With Prince Nanda's withdrawal from his Shan campaign, the horse lords to the north were still one of Bayanog's biggest threats. Assembling an army of some 20,000, 
Bayanog split his army in two. One army led by Minkong would advance on the city of Ava from Tonggu province, while another army led by Thado Minsa would advance on the banks of the Irrawaddy River from Pagan and meet his brother at the city of Ava. Commanding 200 warboats that would sail up the Irrawaddy was the governor of Prome, Thado Damayaza. The fourth and final brother of Bayanog would stay behind in Martaban in case the Thai got any ideas. Bayanog would station himself in his new capital, along with Nanda, prepared to meet Erekan if they too saw this as an opportune moment to invade. The Confederation of Shan states prepared to meet the armies of Tungu once more. This time, the Tungu would not tuck tails and run. The three brothers advanced on Ava as planned and besieged the city. With their superior firepower in the form of cannons and firearms purchased from Portuguese traders, they took the city of Ava in January of 1555. With the city's capture, the youngest brother of Bayanog, Thado Minsa, was given his own province to govern over, with his seat being the city of Ava. The campaign paused for only a brief moment before the three brothers turned north yet again. Continuing up the banks of the Irrawaddy River, they proceeded in their crushing victories over the Shan states, allowing for the conquest of even more of their land. With this, the initial campaign against the Shan states was put on a successful hold. The brother governors returned to their respective provinces, and Bayanog held on to peace for the better part of a year. Over the course of that peaceful year, the Shan state of Mong Nai, one of the most powerful members of the confederation, decided to join Tunggu, fearing their impending conquest. On a more tragic note, the brother of Bayanog and governor of Martaban, Min Yi Sithu, died of unknown causes. He was succeeded by his son as viceroy. The five brother generals would never enjoy another campaign altogether, but the four remaining ones would continue to conquer with his memory behind them. In 1557, Bayanog gathered his largest army yet, some 30,000 men, to invade the Confederation of Shan states. Commanded by his three brothers yet again, along with Prince Nanda, the army went north and faced little resistance. The Shan chiefs and kings submitted to Tungu without a fight, until they reached Hisapa. Here, the Confederation gave their last serious stand, but were defeated by overwhelming odds and gunpowder. By November of 1557, Bayanog had nearly conquered all the Confederation, with only a small number of Shan states managing to evade conquest in the far northeast. He was now the undisputed ruler of central Burma. This would not go unchallenged, however, as Mong Nai, who had submitted peacefully to Tunggu in 1556, revolted. The brother of the ruler of Mong Nai was Makuti, the king of Lan Na, a regional power to the east that commanded much respect. King Makuti supported his brother's war to reclaim Mong Nai, sending in the soldiers of Lan Na. Bayanog, in a display of strength, personally commanded an army that put down this rebellion, showing that he was not one to be trifled with, destroying the armies of Lan Na and Mong Nai in mere months before executing the ruler of Mong Nai. With that, the Shan were back under the control of Bayanog, which meant that he could now incorporate the Shan army into his own. While the Shan infantry was lacking and their navy near nothing, the Shan cavalry was likely the greatest in Southeast Asia. Their horses were much bigger than native Burmese ones, and their men grew up in the saddle, much like a steppe nomad of Central Asia would. With the Shan cavalry incorporated into the gunpowder tactics of the Tungu army, this combination would prove to be a near unstoppable wrecking ball across Indochina. With the Shan subdued, the campaign of 1557 came to a halt. The brothers of Bainog went back to the drawing board to plan their next conquest. Lan Na had proven that they would not accept Tungu hegemony, and King Makuti's involvement in the Mong Nai Rebellion was an unforgivable act that could not go unchallenged. For this campaign, the three brothers of Bainog and Prince Nanda led their own armies, while Bainog himself commanded the main army. In 1558, the invasion began and arrived at the Lan Na capital of Chiang Mai at the end of March. Bayanog offered King Makuti a peaceful surrender and gave him three days to deliberate. On the second day, King Makuti chose to surrender and was spared his life. He was then brought back to Pegu, where he pledged to become one of Bayanog's vassal kings. 
Shortly after the Tungu army's return from the Lan Na campaign, something unexpected happened. One of the most powerful kings in Laotian history, Sadathirith of Langzhang, invaded Lan Na and took the eastern half of the newly incorporated kingdom. For a short five years before Makuti, Sadathirith was the king of Lan Na, before coming to rule Langzhang. However, he stayed in Langzhang for far too long, and the nobles of Lan Na chose Makuti as their new king. Now, Sadathirith was here to reclaim his lost throne from the foreign invader that was Bayanog. By this point in 1558, the bulk of the Tungu army was in the northeast, conquering one of the leftover Shan states of Hesenwi. They succeeded in this, but were now faced with the prospect of defeating an invasion from Langzhang. Bayanog called upon his brother, Thado Minsa, to expel Sadathirith from Lan Na. After a few months of grueling combat with the forces of Lang Zhang, Thado Minsa managed to force Sadathirith back into the Laotian jungles by the end of 1558. With this nuisance put to the side, the campaign to finally end the Shan Confederation was resumed. When the Tungu armies arrived at the doorsteps of the Shan rulers, they submitted to Tungu one by one. Now the Confederation of Shan states, that had been the premier power in northern Burma for two centuries, were finally subdued by the men of Myanmar. His northern flank was now completely secured by mountains on every side. However, there was still one small problem here. The Hindu kingdom of Manipur to the west had territorial claims on one of the previous Shan states, named Kale. When Tungu conquered Kale, Manipur did not relinquish their territorial claim, leaving a good casus belli for Bayanog to add more land to his expanding domain. In December of 1559, the invasion began, but this army was unlike any Tungu army before it. It was barely even ethnic Burmese or Mon. Instead, it was made up of almost all Shan men. Putting these new conscripts to the use, nearly 10,000 Shan crossed the border into Manipur, and for the first time, a Tungu army entered the Indian subcontinent. In two months, the city of Manipur surrendered, and the rest of the kingdom fell along with it. Now, on top of Shan soldiers, Bayanog also incorporated ethnically Hindu warriors into his military. With this explosion of conquest, Bayanog decided to sit on his victories for two years, from 1560 to 1562. However, he was only postponing more conquest to prepare for his most ambitious campaign yet, the conquest of Thailand. Bayanog had once assisted Taban Shwedi in his attempt to take the Kingdom of Siam, their armies on the very doorstep of victory at the Thai capital Vayutaya, before being forced to withdraw when the rainy season arrived. The Tungu Empire was in a far more favorable position to conquer Thailand this time around. With the conquest of Lan Na, the Burmese now surrounded Thailand on two different fronts. The campaign to take Thailand started in the exact same way that Taban Chwedi's campaign started. A Tungu army marched on the city of Tavoy on the Malay Peninsula, managing to take it without the Thai responding. Taking the city allowed Bayanog to cut mainland Thailand off from its provinces in the Malay Peninsula, cutting the kingdom nearly in two. Before starting the proper invasion of Siam, Bayanog first wanted to secure his northern flank from the Shan to the far northeast. These Shan were mostly made up of ethnically Chinese and differed slightly in culture from the members of the confederated Shan states. Bayanog sent his three brothers and Prince Nanda north to subdue them. Kentung surrendered without a fight, while the other Chinese Shan put up more of a resistance. However, the Tungu easily defeated and subjugated their lands over the span of a few weeks. After a census was conducted over his newly acquired lands, Bayanog assembled his largest army to date, numbering some 50,000 men. From here, he demanded from the king of Thailand, Maha Chakarapat, two of his prized white elephants. Pound for pound, these albino beasts were more valuable than gold and more precious than silk. Maha Chakarapat refused, and with that, Bayanog set course to conquer Thailand in November of 1563. On course with the previous campaign, the main army, led by Bayanog, crossed the border through the Three Pagodas Pass. 
while another army, led by his brother, that Ominsa, entered Thailand further north, using the Mao Lamei Pass. A third army, led by the vassal king of Lan Na, Makuti, would enter Thailand from the north. The invasion was off to a bad start, as King Makuti refused to join Bayanog's campaign, instead revolting and allying himself with King Sethirith of Langjiang for protection. Frustrated but not yet defeated, Bayanog continued his Siamese campaign without the forces of Lan Na. He first battled the governor of Fitzanaluk, whom he defeated in open battle. The governor then fled behind the walls of his city, where he soon surrendered to Bayanog and agreed to assist him in his campaign. After this, the armies moved south, inching their way ever closer to Ayutthaya. Blocking their path was the once mighty kings of Sukutai, who had fallen in recent centuries to become vassal kings of Siam. Their king, Thamaracha, submitted to Bayanog without a fight, and also joined him in his conquest, swelling his already massive army to nearly 60,000 men. From here, Bayanog marched on Ayutthaya, hoping to succeed where he and Tabanshwedi had failed. In front of them was the obstacle of a capital surrounded by rivers and a swamp around that, with three Portuguese warships protecting the harbor. After a few weeks of exchanging artillery with the fortress and the warships, the Burmese managed to capture the Portuguese boats, leaving the path to conquer Ayutthaya wide open. Bayanog ordered a non-stop artillery barrage on the city itself that lasted for days, killing civilians and soldiers alike. After the bombardment ceased, King Maha Chakarapat came out of his capital under the white flag of truce. He surrendered and conceded to the demands of Bayanog. These included a yearly tribute of 300 pounds of silver, 30 war elephants every year, four white elephants, and the son of Maha Chakarapat, Ramaswan. Maha Chakarapat also had to abdicate his throne and become a monk in favor of his son, Mahinthrathirat. And lastly, Siam would become a vassal kingdom of Tungu, formally completing the conquest of Thailand. Siam was now Bayanog's puppet, but the campaign could not end here. There was still the problem of King Makuti of Lan Na, who had revolted against Bayanog at the start of the invasion. Bayanog then turned his army north to subdue Lan Na once again. The 60,000 strong army arrived at the Lan Na capital of Chiang Mai. The defenders inside needed no convincing of their impending doom and ran out of the city before a siege could even begin. King Makuti begged for Bayanog's mercy, which he granted and sent him to Pegu where he would live out the rest of his days. In his place, Bayanog placed a new vassal ruler in Lan Na. A woman named Visu de Devi would become the new queen of Lan Na. After this, Bayanog was forced to return to Pegu, which had erupted into rebellion from Shan peoples that Bayanog had resettled in the capital. The Shan rebels burned down much of the city and the royal palace. Bayanog entered a scorched city as the rebels dispersed into the countryside. The capital would need rebuilding. Bayanog saw this as nothing more than an opportunity to flex his might. With Lan Na brought back under the fold of Tungu, there was only their ally to deal with, King Sethirith of Lang Zhang, a man who continued to be a thorn in the side of Emperor Bayanog. This time, Bayanog decided to invade Lang Zhang, lest he face more disruption in future campaigns. The army was to be headed by Crown Prince Nanda himself. Nanda had proven that he was capable of leading detachments of armies under the overall command of his father and uncles, but he had never been the supreme commander of a campaign up until this point. He proved his merit as the son of Southeast Asia's greatest conqueror and took the Langjiang capital of Vientian in early 1565, although the war was not over. King Sethirith escaped into the jungles and continued harassing Tungu armies by use of guerrilla warfare. Nanda was forced to chase the king who evaded him at every turn, leaving his armies to face death by arrows that appeared from the midst of the jungle or by the simple harshness that is the land of Lao. Nanda gave up on capturing Sethirith and installed his son-in-law 
as the vassal king of Langzhang, although Sedathirith still had nominal control over most of the kingdom, excluding Vientiane. Nanda returned to Pegu and brought with him many Langzhang nobles as hostages, including the brother and cousins of Sedathirith. With Thailand conquered, Lan Na subdued, and Sedathirith on the run, Bayanag found this opportunity to enjoy a rare peace. From 1565 to 1568, the Tungu armies went on no major campaigns, instead defending their borders from the likes of King Sedathirith, who continued to grow in strength. Eventually in 1567, Sedathirith besieged and retook his capital, expelling the Tungu from his lands. Meanwhile at Pegu, Bayanag was overseeing the rebuilding of his burnt city. He reconstructed his palace, this one even grander than the last. He even rebuilt the city walls, having 20 gates with five on each side of the gridded square. Each of these gates was funded and built by the 20 vassal rulers that Bayanag had gathered in his conquests. Each vassal ruler would enter through the respective gate when they were summoned to Pegu. To the north, there was Siam, Tenasirim, Martaban, Pagan, and Basan. To the east, there was Prome, Ava, Tungu, Dala, and Langzhang, in which no vassal king would enter for some time. To the south, there was Lanna, Momik, Moyen, Mogong, and Tavoy. And lastly, to the west, there was Kale, Mon, Niangshui, Therawadi, and Teni. These gates cemented Tungu's reign over the regions that they had conquered, as it was quite literally set in stone. In 1568, the deposed king of Siam, turned monk, Maha Chakarapat, was given permission by Bayanag to return to his homeland on grounds of a religious pilgrimage. He soon abandoned his Buddhist robes and retook the throne of Thailand from his son. He then formed an alliance with King Sedathirith of Langzhang and prepared to get revenge on his subjects to the west, who had flipped sides to Bayanag during his 1563 conquest of Siam. He targeted the governor of Fitsanilok and Sukutai, Maha Thamaracha. Together, the Lao and Thai marched on the city and began to siege it. Bayanag responded by mustering another huge army, numbering some 70,000 men. Splitting his army in fifths, he entrusted himself, his three brothers, and his son to reclaim Thailand under the Tungu banner. One of the armies was sent to break the siege of Fitsanilok, but they could not defeat the besieging force of Ayutthaya and Vientiane. The Tungu army instead decided to break through the siege line and join the defenders inside. The combined and besieged garrison then plotted on how the siege could be broken. While they didn't have the numbers to sally out and defeat the army, they held the advantage of blocking off the river they sat on. Flaming rafts were then constructed in the city and sent downstream, much to the displeasure of the Thai fleet, which was all but destroyed by the flames. With that, the hopes of continuing the siege dwindled, and both armies started to withdraw. The Burmese pursued the retreating armies, hopeful to catch one of them off guard, until they themselves were caught off guard by King Sedathirith. The ambush turned into a slaughter, as the Tungu played directly into the hand of their opponent. With the Tungu army in the region put to the sword, the Thai returned to the sparsely defended city of Fitsanilok. The unprepared garrison was surprised, and the city fell to the Thai army. Another one of the five Tungu armies was defeated by the Laotians while marching on Ayutthaya. They were in turn defeated themselves by one of the three remaining armies and Sedathirith was forced to withdraw to his domains in Langzhang. King Sedathirith may have been defeated in the end, but he had just annihilated two Tungu armies and proved yet again that he was a formidable opponent. The three remaining armies marched on Ayutthaya and put the city to the siege. The Tungu attempted to mine under the walls and place explosives, but the Thai constantly sallied out to prevent them. There was also an attempt to build a bridge across the moat to reach the upper battlements of Ayutthaya. This too failed under constant harassment from the garrison. Sometime during the initial phases of the siege, the rebel king of Thailand, Maha Chakarapat, died of unknown causes. His son, who was formerly the vassal of Bayanag, 
retook his crown and took over the siege in his place. The Burmese attackers decided on a new course of action to take the city. A spy of Thai origins was sent into the city before opening the gates on the night of August 7th of 1569. The city was stormed and taken shortly after. King Mahanthrathirat was taken as a hostage and in his place, Bayanag chose to appoint the loyal governor of Fitzsanalak, Maha Thamaracha, as the new king of Thailand. For Thamaracha, who belonged to the dynasty of Sukhothai, this was a return to a lost glory as they had controlled most of Thailand in the 13th century before becoming a vassal state of Ayutthaya. With the rebellious kings of Ayutthaya dethroned and dead, Bayanag could finally rear his attention back onto his biggest rival, the elusive king of Langjiang. After retreating to Vientiane in 1569, King Setathirath gathered his treasury and armory, then he abandoned his capital altogether, taking his army with him into the Laotian countryside. He planned on beating the Tungu invasion as he had before, by use of guerrilla tactics and by the jungles of his country. Bayanog took personal command of the 1569 Langjiang campaign, marching with his brothers and his son into the Laotian countryside. When Ming Kong and his army arrived at Vientiane, he found the capital was barely defended and easily took it. The five armies then began their unsuccessful search for Setathirath. For an entire year, Tungu armies attempted to hunt him down. All the while, their men died from starvation and sheer exhaustion. In 1570, Bayanag called off the invasion and returned to Pegu. After the Tungu departure, Setathirath returned to Vientiane and retook his capital city. From here, the king of Langjiang developed a new strategy to defeat his Burmese rivals. In 1571, he began an invasion of Khmer. Controlling Khmer would give Setathirath not only access to Cambodian warriors and elephants, but also access to the ocean and by extension, access to gunpowder weapons that he could use to match the Tungu arsenal. A solid plan, but perhaps one that was too ambitious, as the Khmer defeated the invasion and sent Setathirath packing. Setathirath went back to Langjiang. While he was gone, the nobles of his kingdom were plotting his overthrow. Upon his return, the 37-year-old warrior king of Langjiang was assassinated by his own people. He left behind one child to succeed him, a boy, who was born mere months before his father's untimely death. A regent would need to rule in his place for 18 years before he came of age. Setathirath's right-hand general, Sen Solintha, then led the Langjiang army back to the capital from the failed Cambodia campaign. He deposed the infant son of Setathirath and declared himself as the king of Langjiang. This move was unpopular among the Lao, and many refused to recognize the legitimacy of this usurper. With Bainog's greatest rival dead, and Lang Zhang on the brink of civil war, the Burmese king thought it was due time to finally bring the kingdom of Lang Zhang into his empire. Another Tungu army was sent to Lao in 1572, this one only numbering 6,000 men, a far cry from the previous Tungu invasions. Sen Solintha easily defeated this negligible force before they could even reach Vientiane. The now furious Bainog exiled this general in charge of the campaign, and immediately began to raise a new army to conquer Lang Zhang. This time, he would personally lead the invasion. When the call to assemble an army went out to his vassals throughout the empire, many of them could not meet the quota, their manpower having been sapped in the Laotian jungles. If Bayanog went forward with this conscription, there was a chance that his vassals would start to revolt. Frustrated, the emperor decided it better to wait a year before returning to Langjiang. Bayanog impatiently waited for 1574 before conscripting a new army. This time, many of the vassals came to him, their regiments full of a dwindling supply of good fighting men. However, his northernmost subjects, the Shan of Moyin and Mogong, refused to send soldiers and revolted against the emperor. They had revolted once before, in 1571, but were easily stomped out in that same year. Frustrated but still determined on the prize of Lang Zhang, Bayanog sent his brother, Thad Ominsaw, 
to subdue the Shan Rebellion. Simultaneously, Bai Nog took his new army and personally invaded Lang Zhang. The usurper king, Sen Solintha, evacuated Vientian and prepared to face Bai Nog in another guerrilla campaign. He didn't get far before his own people, that despised him for stealing the throne, captured him and brought him to Bayanog. The Burmese emperor took the capital city and installed the brother Setathirath, who had been a hostage in Pegu since the initial Burmese invasion, as the new king of Langzhang. The Lao accepted him as their king, and after three failed invasions, the kingdom of Langzhang was now formally part of the Tungu Empire. Bayanog returned to Pegu, taking the usurper king back with him as a hostage. Bayanog had just created the largest empire ever to be seen in the history of Southeast Asia. And by extension, he had just become the greatest conqueror in the history of Southeast Asia. His domain stretching from the modern day country of Vietnam in the east to India in the west, and from the southernmost reaches of present day Thailand to China in the north. The Northern Shan still remained in revolt using the mountains of the Himalayas to conduct guerrilla warfare. This lasted until 1576, when Bayanog led an army to subdue them. He captured their rulers, paraded them around the vassal gates of Pegu in a triumph, then sold them as slaves in India. With his empire in a state of peace and all his rivals eliminated, Bayanog brought his attention onto religious matters. The brand of Buddhism he and many other Burmese and Thai followed was called Theravada Buddhism. It was brought to Burma from Ceylon, the island home to the modern day country of Sri Lanka, over 500 years ago. Theravada presented itself as the most original form of Buddhism. It was mostly secluded to Ceylon before the Burmese adoption, as the Hindu gods reigned supreme over the Indian subcontinent. In 1576, these Theravada brothers across the Indian Ocean called for aid from Bayanog. The Portuguese had designs on Ceylon for the past few decades, even stealing a tooth of the Buddha, a religious relic whose numbers should have been limited at 32, but always seemed to increase over the years. The King of Kot, whose lands rested on the western coast of Ceylon, presented Bayanog with his daughter's hand in marriage in 1573, and further sweetened this relationship by sending the emperor a tooth of the Buddha in 1576 likely to safeguard it from any of the numerous Portuguese raiding parties, or the rebellion that had just broken out in the Kingdom of Kot. The tooth and a daughter were enough to secure military aid from the great Theravada king of Burma. Five warboats and 2,500 of Tungu's most elite soldiers made the journey across the Indian Ocean before arriving in western Ceylon. The gleeful king of Kot pointed in the direction of his rebellion and the detachment of Tungu eliminated them with minimal losses. When the other kings of Ceylon learned of the Burmese arrival, three of them flocked to acquire an alliance with Tungu. This was in turn granted by the Tungu generals under the condition that the kings of Ceylon keep the Theravada faith alive. After this, the Tungu army returned to Bayanog, and the emperor sent sporadic detachments of men to assist the men of Ceylon, mostly against the encroaching Portuguese. After the return of the 1576 Ceylon expedition, Bayanog decided to give his empire a break from the systemic warfare that had formed it. From 1577 to 1580, this peace lasted, before it was disrupted by a rebellion in the far east of Langzhang. Bayanog gathered a large army and marched into the periphery of his empire. The rebels dispersed without a fight. All they needed was a little reminding of Tungu might. By this time in 1580, it had been 30 years since the death of Tavanshwadi, and Bayanog was nearing his 65th birthday. The days of leading armies from the front lines was long behind him, and the king's health started to slip. The crown prince, Nanda, took over many of Bayanog's responsibilities, as he no longer had the energy to run the empire he had created. Bayanog knew his time was limited, and while he had restored Tavanshwadi's empire, he still hadn't avenged him completely. The Kingdom of Arakan on the western coast had pushed back a Tungu invasion in 1547. It was only fitting that Bayanog would make his final campaign, the conquest of Arakan. 24,000 Tungu soldiers crossed the border, and just as they had in Tavanshwedi's campaign, they
they occupied Arakan, taking the stronghold city of Thandwe. All that was left was a march on the capital of Merakyu. Bayanog sent another army, numbering some 30,000 men, to reinforce the invasion. They, however, stayed inactive in Thandwe for most of a year. Bayanog wanted to lead the march on Merakyu himself, but the 65-year-old emperor grew gravely ill in 1581. He remained in this sickly state in Pegu, probably reflecting on his life full of war, conquest, and regrets, until his death came on October 10th of 1581. Bayanog's legacy remains active in the Burmese popular imagination. He is considered to be one of the three great kings of Burma, alongside Anawarta of Pagan and Alangwampaya of Kongbong. Bayanog is indeed probably the greatest among these three select kings, if the ranking is on military prowess alone. Bayanog is with no doubt the greatest conqueror in the history of Southeast Asia, and certainly one of the greatest conquerors of all time, but we must remember how he got here in the first place. If it was not for the trust and friendship that he shared with his crib mate, Taban Shwedi, then he would have never become king in the first place. There is no Taban Shwedi without Bayanog, and there is no Bayanog without Taban Shwedi, and without either one of them, there is no Tungu Empire. <laughs>